This is Glenn Lowry. Uh, I say to Blogging Heads uh, viewers, I'm uh, with bloggingheads.tv. This is The Glenn Show. I'm a professor at Brown University in the economics department and uh, with the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs, which sponsors The Glenn Show. And it's my great pleasure to welcome two, count them, two guests uh, for the conversation today. Uh, there is uh, Ernesto Cortez, uh, of the uh, Southwest Industrial Areas Foundation, uh, and there is Peter Scarry of, uh, of Boston College. Uh, let me just take a brief moment to introduce my two guests and then uh, to describe a little bit what the subject of our conversation is uh, here today, and then we'll uh, kick it off the way. Ernie is a fabled community organizer in the uh, tradition of Saul Alinsky with the Industrial Areas Foundation based in Austin, Texas, but with the Southwest Industrial Areas Foundation has uh, been active throughout uh, the South, the West and Southwest of the country. Um, he is in the business of empowering people to be able to be more effective in advocating for their interests, to understand their interests and to then be more effective in bringing powers that be uh, into conversation uh, with people uh, the IAF works through religious organizations, uh, institutions, churches, and synagogues uh, as a basis for organizing people, although it is, uh, it is a secular uh, enterprise. Uh, and uh, he has many uh, accomplishments to his credit, including a MacArthur uh, Prize Fellowship, the so-called Genius Award from some years ago. Uh, he's been awarded honorary degrees at a number of universities. Um, and uh, is uh, one of my friends whom I, whose friendship I most value over many years, uh, and I've learned a great deal from the work that he does. Peter Scarry is an academic political scientist. Uh, his uh, book, uh, The Ambivalent Minority on uh, Mexican Americans in the Context of American uh, uh, Political Economy uh, was an award-winning book. Uh, he's also written a book called Counting on the Census, as CB says, that's your most recent book, uh, Peter. I don't know if that still remains to be the case. Uh, but um, Counting on the Census, Race, Group Identity, and the Evasion of Politics. Uh, Peter has affiliations over the years with both the Brookings Institution, where he's a research fellow, as well as with the, um, the American Enterprise Institute. Um, and uh, Peter has a background in politics. Uh, you were, uh, you worked with Senator uh, Moynihan's staff at uh, one point uh, earlier in your career, I believe, um, and uh, has been writing about uh, ethnicity and uh, immigration issues uh, for, for many years. Uh, I've known Peter for a long time. So here we are, uh, and it's a three-way conversation. Uh, and, uh, just to kind of give some sense before we get going of, you know, what motivated the conversation, uh, both Ernie and I have been having a conversation over the years, and Peter and I have been having a conversation over the years about the complexities of the American ethno-political structures uh, in, uh, with respect to the relationships between African American and Latino American, Hispanic American, Mexican American, uh, uh, ethnicities and the interest of these groups, the um, implications of the change in American politics of late uh, with the advent of Donald Trump, with the rise of populism, with the increased concern about the border, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the relationship between the uh, aspirations and the claims uh, and the narratives of uh, various non-white populations within the American polity, uh, African Americans and Mexican Americans in the Southwest in particular. Um, and I thought it could be very uh, stimulating and instructive to carry on a conversation, a debate to some extent amongst uh, people who approach these questions from different uh, points of view. There's Ernie in uh, Texas, uh, uh, who's uh, been working there for many decades uh, at grassroots, trying to bring communities together, communities of color included. Uh, there is Peter, uh, whose scholarship has uh, touched on these issues. Uh, and so here we are, and here am I. Um, and uh, viewers of the Glenn Show know that uh, uh, my, uh, one of my main concerns is about uh, the politics of, uh, of African-American um, advocacy here uh, in the 21st century. 
uh, the problems of, uh, of uh, black uh, populations in terms of over-incarceration and underrepresentation in various venues of American life. Um, and uh, a, I will just say, and maybe this can serve as a stimulating kind of initial uh, foray here in this conversation, I've had a concern about the tendency of many pundits to uh, elide what I believe are important and subtle distinctions uh, between uh, African American and uh, Latino minority populations in the country to view uh, the debate about immigration through the lens of race, of non-whiteness, of a concern about white people to preserve their prerogatives over and against those who come into the country from south of the border who are, quote, not white, close quote. I use the quotes because it's not at all clear what it is that we mean when we talk about whiteness uh, in that context, at least it's not at all clear to me, um, and about the potential for conflicts of interest as well as for opportunities for cooperation between these two minority groups, about the fact that uh, the Latino population now outnumbers the African-American population, about control of the narrative uh, in debating on uh, questions of equality of opportunity and of social justice in the United States, about the appropriation of moral arguments entirely suited to the historical experience of African Americans by those who may not have had those experiences, but uh, share with African Americans the fact that they're not white uh, Anglos and so on. So uh, these are concerns of mine. And to some degree, I believe they are also concerns of uh, uh, Peter Scarry, and they are matters of interest to Ernesto Cortez. So here we are. Forgive that long introduction, audience. Forgive that long introduction, Peter and Ernie. But I'm now going to step aside and allow you guys to correct anything I said that was inaccurate. Uh, and then, you know, we can start arguing. Good. Uh, Peter. Peter? Go ahead, Ernie. Well, I was, I was uh, doing a training session last week at uh, the Pacific School of Religion. And as part of the training, uh, we had, we, they went to an action put together by the IAF organization in uh, Solano County, Fairfax, that area, um, which is notorious for being bankrupt, okay, and uh, in difficulties. There were about uh, close to 300 people there at the action, and uh, they had the chief of police, the mayor, and they and they went at some issues like, you know, renter protection and and the, the challenge of, of police shootings among kids of color, both African-American and Latino. And they met with the chief of police. But what was most interesting to me about the, the action was not the engagement with the public officials, was that they broke up into house meeting groups of seven people per table and bilingually for 30 minutes conducted what we call a house meeting where they began to talk about some of the concerns that they had and how these concerns were taking shape, whether it had to do with with uh, rent control or rent, you know, people being told that they had to increase their rents by a thousand dollars, etc. But more importantly was the kind of the building of the network of relationships among people. And they beginning practice politics both with each other, but also with public officials. And the fact that they're committed to doing that kind of campaign of doing those kind of house meetings all across Solano County. And the same thing is going to go be taking place in Salinas and Watsonville and up and down the state of California. And the uh, energy and the imagination and the joy that people had when they were given that opportunity to do that kind of engagement, that kind of participation, uh, belies some of our stereotypes of these folks that they really don't want to be citizens, they don't want to be civically engaged, they don't want to be involved, and it, it suggests to me that they bring a lot of energy, imagination, joy, and commitment to rebuilding some of the institutions that we are con constantly uh, concerned about, okay, and uh, I think it offers a great hope uh, for politics in the future. Anyway, I just want to start with that, and I, I got a lot more to say, but I'll wait I'll defer to Peter for right now. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Well, thanks, Ernie, and thanks, thanks, Glenn. Um, it's great to have this discussion with the two of you. We've been working at it for a while now to get together. Yeah. Um, so, well, I think Ernie has rightfully 
jumped in um, to the world and the in the arena that um, for which I have enormous respect and um, where he is obviously um, completely and thoroughly at home. And that is in the in the world of of uh, organizing and bringing together communities for effective political action. And um, uh, but <clears throat> I have to say, I think he's he sort of jumped ahead of us a bit um, because. Um, pardon me. That is fair. Okay, but you know that's that's fine. To me, the questions are. are I mean, sure, we we. we in many ways, from different uh, perspectives, from different communities in America t- today, do we need to figure out ways to come together and find some common objectives to agree upon and work together constructively? Uh, <clears throat> the question is, who's the we, what the objectives are? And um, um, to me, um, as Glenn and I have talked about, and to some extent, uh, Ernie as well, um, while I share the desire, the goal, the, uh, uh, you know, the, the end goal of, of um, these two large groups in America, uh, Latinos and, and African Americans, uh, coming together uh, and working on common objectives, um, those aren't the only two groups in America that I'm concerned about coming together for common objectives. And I'm not suggesting that, that it's, that's not true for the two of you as well. Um, but it's not at all clear to me that that's as straightforward uh, or, even, or even as doable as I suspect Ernie does. I I'm, I'm, don't mean to be projecting views onto him, but I think that's pretty fair. And um, before we even get to where Ernie begins the discussion, we have to look at some of the evidence as to uh, how blacks and Latinos are differently situated in America. And that's, you know, that's obviously not an easy question, but that's what I think what we're here to talk about. I don't disagree with you one bit on up here. The only problem I have is we never get beyond the, um, the situation, the context, the, 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 the categories which separate people. Okay. And never think about the fact that, you know, maybe uh, we, we can figure out a way to get people to kind of bracket their prejudgments, their prejudices, to, in a way, and think hard about, you know, where they have some concerns. I mean, unfortunately, or fortunately, the problem with, with rents is not just affecting Latinos and African Americans in Solano County. Mm. It's also affecting people in Oakland, uh, people in <laughs> Salinas, Seaside, all across the coastal areas. Yeah, California. It's affecting people in Bakersville, in in in, in, in uh, Fresno, where we're just beginning to organize, and the people who are affected are. Uh, People, members of Jewish synagogues, members of Protestant churches, uh, Anglo Catholics, Italian Catholics. Uh, so it's, it cuts across a lot of different groups of people. And so, yes, there are big differences in the way in which people are treated. Yes, there are big differences in the way people see their identity. But there's also some common difficulties. Okay, they all have to pay the same price for gasoline, for food, for bread. They're squeezed by the the, the uh, the, the paucity of resources that some of these elementary schools have. Uh, they have to deal with the lack of training of, uh, of police departments because so much of the money that police departments were getting were for things like, you know, machine guns and uh, uh, SWAT units and lots of uh, hardware, no money for training, no money for community policing uh, and no money for teaching officers how to connect with people, relate to people. I remember being at a, we had a retreat with, when Bratton was chief of police of Los Angeles. And we went through, we, ha, we had the police captains, the heads of the different uh, branches of the LAPD, sit down with us and do house meetings. And one of the sergeants said to us, none of our rookies could do this. 
they don't have the maturity to be able to do this kind of engagement. Okay, they need a lot more training and development before and mentoring before they could do this. Uh, they're they're not. That's not how they. That's not their orientation. And I'm not trying to suggest in any way, or shape, or form that these are bad people. I'm just saying that they they they're rookies. They're, they're young. They're new. They're not. Sure. They don't know how to engage people. Sure. Look, but, look er, Ernie. Um, I think I think we can all agree that the uh, struggles of uh, disadvantaged and marginalized people uh, transcend uh, ethnic identity and, and, and racial boundaries. I mean, we could put white people in there too. There are plenty of white people uh, who are on the short end of uh, how public policy plays out at the local, state, and national level. Uh, we could talk about health care, we could talk about policing, or we could talk about uh, jobs or, you know, whatever. So I think we can all agree about that. I, I, I think the question, though, and, and, and perhaps in a perfect world, a world where identity politics played no role whatsoever, the only issues in front of us uh, as uh, people who are more or less progressive in our orientation would be how to organize and bring to bear the on the powers that be, the concerns and the, uh, the needs of, of people who are at the margins of society. Um, but in fact, we don't live in that world where there is no identity politics. We, no, live, in a world, we live in a world where Chewy Garcia runs against uh, Rahm Emanuel for the Democratic nomination of uh, mayor in, uh, a few years ago in Chicago, and Blacks have to decide whom they're going to support in that election, and they have to decide what the nature of their relationships with their Latino uh, fellows is going to be and whether or not they actually are on the same page and have the same interests. Uh, or we have to deal with the fact that in uh, low-skilled labor markets where there are people of various uh, ethnic backgrounds coming into this uh, common uh, economic situation, there will be factors at play that might work to the disadvantage of one group or the advantage of the other in that context. There will be competition over resources at the local level It'd be better if you could make the pie bigger for everybody, but the fact of the matter is the pie is what the pie is, and there's going to be competition about that. Um, so, uh, the, you know, it doesn't do us any good to pretend that that's not so. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, 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 and priority and, and whatnot, and, and also over the narrative, you know, but anyway, let me stop. I, I think I've said enough to. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Bernie, can I add one log onto the sure. fire and then you can respond? Because I think as a friendly amendment to what Glenn just said, um, and kind of picking up on what you were saying, um, you know, if we're going to talk about uh, uh, bringing a community together or organizing a community, particularly when it comes to uh, uh, Latinos, um, and certainly today in this era, but I think this has been true for, for several decades, we have to define what the community is and who's part of it. And if we're talking about uh, people who are migrants um, who have come here, many of them, um, you know, very recently, or who have come here under conditions or under legal legal situations that are not considered uh, um, um, uh, legitimate by large numbers of, of members of the community who are already here, well, then we have to talk about what the community consists of. Uh, and, and, and then we can begin to talk about how it comes together. Uh, okay, I missed the last um, so part. I, I think that's, I would say that's... I missed the last part of what you said. I missed the last part of what you said. Well, I'm not, um, just that um, we're, we're, we're about... Uh, we need to define who's a member of the community. And if we're talking about Latinos and, 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 and migrants, obviously there are, there are aspects of that large grouping of people whose presence here is not clearly uh, leg considered legitimate by other members of the community. And I'm talking, of, I'm, I'm talking specifically now about people who, who arrive here uh, you know, in undocumented status or people who are trying to get across the border now Who's who's a part of the community? Um, well, okay, but let, let's let's be let's be clear. At least my understanding of everybody I've talked to and everything I've read says that the uh, unauthorized immigration from Mexico is virtually zero. In fact, it's negative. More people are going back now 
uh, that are coming into the United States. Okay. Sure. Okay. So that's number one. So we got to acknowledge that, that that that's a reality, a fact on the ground. Well, that's Mexico. That's you're not taking yeah. the position that there is no unauthorized entry no. into the country. In fact, um, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the what we're finding is, at least I'm finding is that there's much more people coming in. Vernon Briggs told me years ago that more people from Ireland come in than come in from Mexico. Okay, and so well, I think Vernon Briggs was wrong, but but he, but there were a lot of Irish coming illegally. That's for sure. That's right. And he was saying that there was more at that one point. There was more illegal Irish coming in. Okay, and yeah. anyway, yeah, he, he may be wrong and whatever, but but his. I just want to be clear that Mexico is not the, doesn't exhaust the uh, source of uh, of immigrants coming across the south, sure. southern border without authorization. No, I agree, but it, let me get to my point. Yes, sir. My okay. point is at least Paul Collier's point, which I have adopted, is that what, what he's what he has found is that in country after country in Africa and Latin America and even in Asia, that in, in Eastern Europe. Families and, and communities are investing more in education and training of young people so that they are then suitable to win the lottery ticket, which is to come to the United States. So the prospect of immigration to the United States has been a positive impact on the investment of these third world countries in education and training and preparation, learning languages, et cetera, learning English, et cetera, going to school, staying in school longer, the young girls learning how to be, you know, more mature, et cetera. Uh, so it benefits them even, even because if they don't get to go to the United States, at least they've gotten, they're better off, although unfortunately they're not the jobs to absorb them once they get that kind of training. But it certainly is beneficial to us because we're getting the best and the brightest uh, from these countries. Uh, and I was always maintain uh, that one of the things that immigrants do for us, for the United States, is that they come to the United States with an irrational, unwarranted, lacking in evidence, belief in the American dream. So they're willing to work 60, 80 hours a week because they think that their children and their grandchildren will do better because of their willingness to work hard, play by the rules, and make investments. And to me, that's an, in, in, you know, their irrational belief is an incredible source of energy, imagination, and investment in human potential. Well, I couldn't disagree with that, except that's only part of the story. Um, because um, many, many of, the, of those people who come here with those aspirations um, don't succeed, um, don't get, feed, get treated fairly by their employers or don't get tr treated fairly by other Americans, some of whom may be of, of people of color themselves. Um, oh, that's and, true. I agree with that. And, and, and of course, if they don't come here um, under, under, under normal you know, procedures, if they come here um, without papers, um, then that it's, you know, it's not clear that the political community, um, it, particularly now, considers that legitimate. And, um, and, has, and, and of course, we both know it's a, a, the segments of the political community have, have resisted uh, often unreasonably and unfairly, I would be the first to admit that, but not entirely without some substance, the fact that large numbers of people from different countries have been coming here illegally and um i mean i think that's really that's a big part of at least what but, i'm but, but this Peter, the concept of illegality is a new one okay my father came here uh as an immigrant without unauthorized he came because he was escaping the violence of the mexican revolution his father was was uh condemned to be you know executed and barely escaped execution because sure. he was on the wrong side of uh of one of Cananza's, uh uh, nephews, okay, and uh, owned a, made the mistake of owning property and restaurants and etc. Uh, but that was not considered a crime. Well, by anybody at that time, okay, and it was not considered a crime. You know, in the sixties, it was it, we criminalized coming to the United States without papers. We've made it a, a crime for. 
frankly, for, for partisan political reasons to kind of demagogue people that this is these people are a threat. And so as a result, I mean, and so many of the people who are here unauthorized are here because they don't feel like they can go back to the country of origin because to, to go back and come back again is to risk committing a felony. Well, I, I in broad terms, I don't disagree with the details of that history. But the fact is, as a political fact, we do have a very clear uh, uh, set of legal conditions now under which people l- arrive here legally or not. But those um, legal that was, that conditions could be fact. changed, okay? My only point is, those legal conditions were not established by God or even the Supreme Court. They were, they were, they were, they were established by state legislatures, okay? And, and they can be changed, okay? And, you know, as we begin to become more clear, I think, of our own interest, we're going to recognize that. I'm told, you, you know this better than I do, that by the year 2030, 10 years from now, mm-hmm. there will be more people over 65 than there will be under 15. Yeah, I, I, I know where you're going, but, you know, that's one, that's one factor in a, in a complicated conversation. And I've heard that argument made for the last several decades. It's not clear it's dispositive. In, in fact, I've heard many demographers argue that it's really not dispositive because guess what? Uh, immigrants get old too, um, and there just aren't enough of them to, to, to overwhelm the, that demographic wave that you're talking about. Immigrants do get old too. That's not the point. The point is that who are, who are forming families, who are having children, who tend to have children, okay? And as people get older okay they obviously they don't have children but also as people women get wealthier they don't have they have fewer children or sometimes no children and they're not going to have children uh they're going to be in, disinclined to have children if there's nobody to care for them particularly if they if they're in careers which have you know which are which are demanding they're going to want child care which is very unaffordable in many places okay well sure uh, but i mean i'm you know so we have, care, we, have but, people, we have people at the beginning of life and at the end of life who need care, okay? And who better to provide the, that care than people who are immigrants, okay? Well, I mean, if that's the only condition or only slice of, you know, reality that we're looking at, that's obviously a reasonable argument. But well, it's not the only reality. There's, there's, there's also construction. There's also agribusiness. There's a I whole understand. But you don't seem to want to recognize or accept the legitimacy of the fact that there are large numbers of Americans now who don't regard the, 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 the equation that you're putting forward as, 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 as legitimate or acceptable. And, and to me, let, let me, let me interview oh, you for no, a minute. I, that's, that's, that's oh, hold on, Ernie. Because... Hold on, Ernie. Hold, hold on, hold on. I've been letting you guys go back and forth and it's all go good. Ahead, it's yeah. all good. But, but I, I just want to say something here and Ernie, I want you to respond to this. Let me credit everything you just said on behalf of migrants that let me, let me stipulate that uh, there are uh, perfectly rational reasons why the society would be benefited uh, incumbent members of the society would be made better off. Fiscal constraints would be relaxed and so on uh, if uh, uh, productive people come into the United States from, from elsewhere. Let me stipulate that. My question is, why shouldn't the incumbent population get to decide who those people are, as opposed to simply having people from wherever decide that they want to come to the United States for a better life and then violate our laws in doing so? It seems to me that that's a bedrock uh, a notion. I'm not arguing it's, against oh, no, I just said it. It's our call. Well, it's our call. This is our call. When I say our, who am I talking about? I'm talking about the American polity. This is not a mm-hmm. humanitarian's call sitting in a suite of offices somewhere. This is not the world court or the United Nations call. This is the American people's call. And the American people are a specific concrete thing, including African-Americans. I don't disagree. And all I'm trying to say to you is, and Peter, what I'm trying to say is, the reason why I'm making the argument so strongly is because I know that it is a political decision. I'm not going to be able to make a, a, uh, I'm not going to be able to make a unilateral decision on immigration policy. I'm going to have to persuade people why it is in their interest 
to, to have a different attitude toward immigrants, migrants, okay? So, for example, all the studies I've seen, whether by Lawrence Katz or your, the, the fellow you borrowed, uh, 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 Borjas, uh, say that the people who are most adversely affected by low-wage immigrants mm. are people who do not have a high school diploma. Okay? Mm. So, how many immigrants unauthorized are there in the United States, adults? Peter, tell me. Um, I had something on the order of seven to eight million. Okay, something like that. I've, I've heard all kinds of numbers, and I've also heard that they've been made up. But anyway. Yeah, the Borjas says 11 million, but he says we don't really know. We really don't know. Like I've, I've been told illegals, but I've been told yeah. Oh, you said Mexican? No, no, no. He said, I was talk, I was factoring in the age factor. And, and oh, okay, he, okay. He was asking about I'm saying unauthorized, okay. Unauthorized, oh. I, fair enough, unauthorized. Unauthorized. Yeah. Now, what if you charge eight, uh, five million of those, a thousand dollars? Said to them, you pay a thousand dollar fine, and then you're you're legal. And if you don't have a felony, okay, and then take that money that comes from that fine, and put it in education of people who drop out, whether they be African American, Latino, or or, or people of a Caucasian background. Yeah, I'm not sure I, I get the drift. Well, my point is, we can, you, we, the, 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 all the studies I read say that the people who benefit most from immigrant, immigrating are the immigrants themselves, okay? Yes. Their income goes up two, three, sometimes five times, okay? Right. So, okay, so why don't we say, okay, come here, we're going to charge you for coming here because you're going to benefit, and when we use the money that, that, that we collect from you, to invest in people who are adversely affected by your coming here. That's one immigration policy of a many that I, one could conceive of. I'm sorry? I said I can sell entry into the United States in a lot of different ways, and one of them is in the way that you propose, but it's not the only one that I could think of. No, yeah. and, and I'm willing to entertain others, okay? My only point is if we collectively, you, Peter, and I, decide that it is good for us to have all this potential talent and energy and imagination, creativity, commitment of people coming to the United States who could kind of restore some of our joy in, uh, you know, evidently there are some commentators who think that we're kind of in a crisis point in terms of energy and imagination and commitment uh, to our own institutions. And that that's dangerous. It's a crisis. Well, one way to revitalize those institutions is bringing in new people. All organizing. Now, I, I just want to understand this. You think that um, a sustained flow of people across the southern border into the country. Oh, and the northern borders, too. Okay. But without authorization is the thing that we're talking about. Is a way to revitalize American institutions? Selectively, of course. I'm not, I, I just said we have the right to control our borders. Okay. Okay. And okay. I'm, not, I'm not opposed to... I mean, I don't want, you know, you know, I mean, uh, I don't want people who are going to come here or are coming here to be predators. I don't want, I'm not looking for that. And I think there's a, you, there are ways of being selective, which are humane and not brutal. Uh, and there are ways of, within that context, to, to also be welcoming to people uh, and not make the mistakes that I think Japan has made and the mistakes that Italy has made and the mistakes that other countries have made uh, uh, and are now, you know, rethinking their immigration policy. I'm told that Canada has been rethinking its immigration policy because of that reason, very recent. Okay. Uh, so, you know, all I'm saying is I think that there are benefits for us, for significant numbers of people to be allowed to come to the United States under certain conditions. Well, no argument, no argument for me on that. Uh, I, I'm not a, you know, I'm not a zero immigration guy. I'm not a restrictionist. Um, to me, it's a question of uh, how we let people in, who we let them in, and also what kind of claims they make once they're once they're here. 
And, and I guess that's where I'd like to move next, but I don't want to preempt things. Glenn, maybe you want to. Uh, no, well, I, I do want to move on from the open, from the, the, yeah. uh, the bare question of, you know, too much, too little, should we have immigration? Yeah. To a consideration of what happens with respect to African Americans in the political environment that we live in, um, and um, I'm I'm just uh, let me just make one point. Okay. Yeah. If I understand the arguments of people like James Q. Wilson in his book on bureaucracy, yeah, and uh, and uh, Hayek and his Constitution of Liberty, the arguments is that. When you give too much latitude to public officials on those kind of decisions, you're always are opening yourself up to the potential for corruption. And I worry about that, okay? A lot and abuse, okay? So that, you know, as much as possible, as much as possible, we need to be as open as possible to people who want to come here to work and to invest in their families and their communities. Okay. And we need, yes. We and, need. and what about the people who are already here? What yeah. about, you know, bringing them online? I mean, uh, you know, we got jails overflowing with Americans of color. Uh, we've got uh, a terrible uh, school failure and lack of human development amongst our indigenous, indigenous incumbent populations and so on. Uh, what's wrong with revitalizing the American uh, labor force going forward by increasing the extent to which people who are already here um, yeah. are included within the uh, uh, orbit of opportunity? But see, I'm for doing that by, frankly, creating a constituency of people who want to support investment in public schools, who want to support investment in workforce development. Okay, We have demonstrated in San Antonio to everybody's, you know, critique that Project Quest, which is a workforce development project, which has been around now for 40 years, works, okay? It's successful. The only problem, it, there's not enough money not enough money in invested in it, so we, there's not enough people we can train, okay? Now, I want to expand it, okay, so that we can train more and more young people, other people of color. Ann Richards came to a meeting of Quest trainees, because we've been getting all this critique from Russ Limbaugh and everybody else. And she said, I've heard, I, I hear from your critics that you're craning, okay? That the people that you're training would have been trained anyway. So she points to a woman and asks, what were you doing before you got in to the Project Quest? And the woman said to Ann Richards, Governor, I was in prison. Now, she was not African-American. She was not Latino. She was white. And she had been in prison. Now, I, those are the people that I want to invest in, okay? But we can't do that unless we're willing to expand the public sector to include those folks in workforce development, education, literacy, healthcare. Okay, let, let me ask you a question, Ernie. You heard, as I did, every Democratic candidate on stage when asked during one of the earlier debates about whether uh, healthcare, uh, the universal healthcare would be extended to unauthorized immigrants, say yes. And here's my question. Did that make it more or less likely that we get universal health care as a political reality in the United States of America? Given the situation, probably less likely. Okay, and, and However, therefore, this, and this therefore you, just let me draw the conclusion. The conclusion is, if I'm interested in elevating the quality of life for Americans of all ethnicities, I need to have control over who comes into the country so that the political agreement necessary to expand social opportunity and social protections for Americans can be arrived at. I agree. If a typical but, voter but, thinks that there's an open door and that the promises that they make to the less well-off among them are made to everybody in the Western Hemisphere, okay, Glenn, it's not going to happen. Reread Ira Katz Nelson's book, when affirmative action was white, because okay. that's the same thing we did, okay? During the new deal with Social Security and the Fair Labor Standards Act, we deliberately excluded African Americans and Latinos so that to be able to make it possible for Social Security. Yeah, but they were citizens, in. Ernie. Yeah. Huh? They were we citizens. deliberately excluded citizens, and it was an outrage. 
It was an outrage. Yeah, but, but we were going to have to exclude somebody because there's 7 billion people on the planet. The, the promises we make to each other to take care of each other as part of a, of a of the same country cannot be universal promises made to all of humankind. I'm not it's asking you to make the promise to all of humankind, but remember something. The people who come here, they go through a relatively arduous, sometimes heroic journey. They're not, you know, we're, you know, we're not sending boats, okay, to, to South Africa. We're not sending, you know, uh, uh, ocean liners, okay, to Sub-Saharan Africa and, and inviting them, come, y'all come and come on over. We're, this is not the reverse of, of what we did to the African-Americans from 1619 on, okay? And, and we're not sending them to, you know, to Chile either and saying, come on to the United States. We're saying to people, if you get here on your own without any assistance, you know, maybe we'll consider you. But those people choose to come here, right? They do. They do. Well, um, if they if they choose and they to come here. pretty arduous. My only point is they we're not made, we're not saying everybody, we're not offering everybody in Vietnam an opportunity to come here. Most people who are come here and who choose to come here, they go through, through a very, very arduous journey. My cab driver, who I use a lot in LA, is Armenian, okay? he First, he went to Spain and learned Spanish, and then he came to the United States, okay? And now he's got his own cab company, okay? He came here as an undocumented person. His wife is a nurse. His kids go to USC. They've graduated from USC. My God, I don't want, you know, why don't I want him? He's Armenian. Yeah, I, I want more people like him, actually, Ernie. Yeah, huh? I get that. <laughs> I said, you have my attention with your Armenian example. Of course, I, I want more people like him to be a part of the... Of, of the... Wait, he barely <laughs> speaks English. Uh, yeah, Ernie, but you've, you've, kind of, you've kind of switched your focus in, a, I, I think, a very telling way. Um, you started off talking about immigrants in the, in the classic terms that I don't dispute. Um, that they they come here and they have something to give and to offer and we need it. Um, okay, but they also come here with needs. They also come here with um, sometimes what you what you said unrealistic aspirations and things often don't work out well for them for lots of complicated reasons. So then you're talking now about the need to provide them with services. But if we're but. There's a complicated trade-off there, so it no, isn't so. No, man, no, no matter how, no matter how dismal the situation is for them, most of them would say they're better off here. I mean, every every you know, at least my my casual empiricism, okay, is that every immigrant I talk to, even though they're going through difficult times, whether it's you know they don't get they didn't get the job they wanted, they didn't get the career they wanted, they're still better off, and they would rather be here than Afghanistan. They'd rather be here than you know. Well, Bangladesh. I think the evidence on that is is, is actually much more complicated. Um, we, you know, it's it's a it's a given. Uh, among they don't move back. Of, they don't move back like they did. The Italians went back. Okay, they didn't stay. Yeah. Well, lots of Mexicans go back or want to go back. They if, want if, to go back. That's true because no, they came here for the work and they came here. But you know, what's also interesting to me is the the the, the amount of the percentage of dollars of remittances that they're sending back to their country. So they're not just, no matter how poor they are, they're still sending money back to their home country. But anyway, go ahead. But, well, the question is their, is their motives. And, and while Americans like to think that everybody in the world, if given half a chance, would like to move here and become an American, I'm sorry to say they're wrong. Most people would just as soon stay where they are and try to prosper. Now, obviously they can't. So what happens historically as well as today is that people come here as migrants, not necessarily intending to stay. And that's well, part of the problem because they well, we have think, mixed, they have mixed well, the policy has made it difficult for them to do it. No, 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 no. It's more it's not simply a function of public policy. Come on, Peter. Now, if you tell public. somebody that if you go back to Mexico and then and you, because you want to go home for a funeral or for a wedding, and then if you come back again, you're committing a crime. You know, you are creating through public policy a disincentive to move to go back. Fine, I don't disagree with that, but that's a very narrow slice of the whole picture. The whole okay. picture. All right. I don't think it's a narrow slice, but it's not the whole picture. But it's not just a narrow slice. Go ahead. 
Okay, it's narrower than I want to look at. So what I'm trying to say is that migrants have very complicated mixed motives, and they all don't they don't simply want to come and stay here. That's been true. Let, let me and, ask Peter a question, Ernie. Um, everybody has complicated mixed motives. I have complicated. Well, Ernie, Ernie, hold on, hold on. Hold but on. if you have if you have complicated motives and you can't and you can't decide you want to stay, then that creates all sorts of problems for yourself in the in the in the new community in which you find yourselves. I you, want to ask we, Peter a question. Go ahead. So, so your book from the 90s is called The Ambivalent Minority, Mexican Americans. Yes. What did you mean? Because I think it's relevant to the conversation that we're having right now. Yeah. Well, I I didn't mean that somehow Mexican uh origin people in the United States, Mexican immigrants, Mexican Americans, I didn't mean that they were somehow psychologically deficient, that they were they didn't know who they were. Uh, it didn't have any of those kind of psychological con- okay. uh, meanings or connotations that I, I, I'm afraid that it was taken to me. Um, um, what it, what I meant was that they come, they came here, and m- most specifically, what I meant in the context of my book, but I'll relate it to the, what I think you're thinking, Glenn, is that they they weren't they were ambivalent about how to define themselves politically. Yeah. Um, were they going to define themselves as a as a traditional typical immigrant group uh, with the politics and the claims on society that that entails, or were they going to make claims more like those of African Americans that we're a group that's been brought here not entirely because we wanted to be here? Obviously, uh, blacks didn't come here at all because they wanted to be here, at least from African slave history. Um, and and how are we going to make claims against the wider polity as a, as a discriminated group that has been treated historically unfairly as African Americans have or as immigrants? Um, so that was the choice. But I think part of it may be in the context of what I was just saying with, with Ernie, some of it also could be construed to, to talk about, well, we're here, but do we plan to stay here? Uh, we want to, we want our kids uh, to you know, go to school in Chicago, but we want to make sure they spend lots of time during the Christmas holidays at home with their relatives in Mexico. And so we bring them home, you know, a few weeks early before the Christmas holidays begin, and we come back a few weeks late. Um, and that kind of ambivalence also figures in too. And before Ernie says anything, I know that kind of movement back and forth right now, and has and for several years hasn't been possible because of the strict, strict border enforcement. I'm aware of that. But I'm talking about a larger historical, sociological... But look, um, Peter, part, part of the difficulty I'm having with this is, first of all, I'm not sure what the... I'm, I'm, I'm kind of lost what your point you're making with me is, number one. Number two, because of the, the mixed motives, I'm not sure what, that, what, the, what the implications of that are. Number two is, as you know... Uh, so many Mexicanos in San Antonio and South Texas and elsewhere. My, hmm. my, my mother was born in Corpus Christi. Uh, uh, my, my, my wife was born in Brownsville. Okay. Uh, so most of my mother's family, which is large, when, when we buried my mother at the age of 94, I mean, she had, you know, 12 brothers and sisters. Okay. And yeah. all of those people grew up in San Antonio. Uh, they, they, now, the only difference was my, my Aunt Beatrice, because she married a Mexican citizen, and so she lived in Mexico City up until recently, okay? So my cousins, Ramon, Carlos, and Mia Cristina, they would come every summer to San Antonio, but they lived in Mexico uh, all, their, all, all, their, all their lives, okay? And they were Mexican citizens, okay? Sure. And now they have dual citizenship, okay? So it, it, they're, they're, it's... it's 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 complicated because it's not people who I mean there 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 have been Mexicans here uh, before the migrations took place. Okay, now some of them were sure. were, were Native American who became Mexicans because the, the 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 church was told that if 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 we're gonna if you, if you make them Mexican, teach them Spanish, and make them Catholic, we won't kill them. Okay, yeah. and you know there was a deal made. Okay, uh, but. So a lot of Native Americans became Mexicans, okay? Uh, but, you know, I guess my point is, for, for a lot of Mexicans, they've been here for a long time. The well, 
I've been here a, lot. a long time. What's a lot? I mean, a lot is a, a lot. I mean, the, the huge preponderance of, of Mexicans in the United States have come here in the last 50 years. I mean, I don't think there's any denying that. That's just I'm, not arguing, I'm not arguing that. But I'm saying is there were, I mean, the, the first alcalde of San Antonio was a guy named Seguin, okay, who was Mexican. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. Sure. And, you know, and notwithstanding Henry Cisneros' achievement, uh, Seguin, you know, preceded him as the alcalde of San Antonio. So it, it's, 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 it's much more. Oh, okay, let, let, not, let me, let me no, channel. If I, could, if I could just respond quickly, Glenn. Sure, of course. Um, Ernie, the, the, the question is then, it's a complicated history, okay? What do we make of that history in terms of making political claims on the present and future generations? That, that, that's what I think the question is. And, well, I, um, I, I don't disagree with that question, but I just don't want to make it so clear that, you know, we wherever we are, have the right to say to them, you know, you're, you're, you're not, you don't have the right to make, you're not part of the decision-making process when part of them have been here long before we even existed. Anyway. Okay. My intention is not to deny anyone's claims. It's to try to weigh things uh, in a politically prudent way in a, in a, in an environment where we've got to make some difficult choices. And politics and think, is always going to be messy and not clear cut and ambivalent. And we're always going to make decisions which end up costing people in ways which are unfair. Now, okay, okay, Ernie, let no. me let me just ask you uh, directly, okay, because I want to get back to talking about race and talking about African Americans. Yeah. So let's take the long view. Let's take the one hundred year view. Okay. So we're sitting here in the year twenty one twenty. What's the future of Mexican Americans, or if you will, Hispanic Americans, in terms of assimilation into the larger American political corpus? Are they, you, more like the Negroes, the Blacks, an indigestible minority, separate, uh, very low intermarriage rates, uh, very little assimilation? Or do they become white, like the Italian immigrants and the Jewish immigrants from Uh, South and Eastern Europe did, uh, if we go back 100 years. Uh, And does it matter what the likely trajectory of uh, social assimilation uh, is for the the larger questions of uh, politics and justice in the country? And finally, does an African-American have any reason to be concerned that we are going to be left behind once again? That is to say, at the turn of the 20th century, when European immigration was flowing at very high levels, the uh, eastern seaboard and Middle West cities of the country became uh, political fiefdoms uh, it, that were uh, in the service of the interest of the ethnic po- populations of those municipalities. And the African-American migrants from the uh, rural districts of the South who came to those very same cities had to stand in line behind, if you will, foreigners in, in order to see whether or not their interests are going to be met. Is that the future of the Southwest of the United States? Well, let me, let me say something here. Is there okay. any and reason for African American to be concerned about? Pardon, I'm just asking a question. Well, let, me, let me say something, okay, which is, which is kind of interesting to me because, uh, and I don't mean this in a, in, a, in a pejorative way, okay? So, Peter, do not be offended by what I'm about to say, okay? Even if you, even if you are, okay? Um, <laughs> don't be, even if you are. <laughs> I don't mean to be. Okay. My wife wants my grandchildren to learn about Harriet Tubman, Tubman, so Jenner yeah. Crew, Frederick yeah. Douglass. She's right on her on her that stand as a biography of Frederick Douglass. Okay, uh, so she thinks it's really really important that my grandchildren, as well as my children, learn about all these folks. Uh, she was delighted when I was invited by my alma mater, a and to be on a speaker's forum with Julian Bond, okay? And we both talked about, you know, the similarities and the distinctions between African-Americans and Latinos, okay? So she would resonate strongly with uh, the passage that you read at the beginning of this conversation. Because she thinks that we have a great deal to learn from the struggles of the African-American community. Uh, 
so now she's not totally representative, mm. but she certainly has a following. She's a librarian. She is now in Philadelphia at an American Library Association conference advocating for bilingual children's literature. But part of the bilingual children's literature that she's advocating for is telling the story of Martin Luther King and Frederick Douglass and uh, uh, all these other great heroes and heroines, okay, of the abolitionist movement uh, and the anti-slavery movement. Uh, so there has been a lot of effort on the part of some political leaders to form common uh, cause or coalitions with between African Americans and Latinos, whereas where you see people like Raul Grijalva, who works with John Lewis on a whole lot of other, a lot of issues. So uh, are there tensions? Are there, are there, are there, is there rivalry? Are, do they bump up against each other? Absolutely. Uh, I started the conversation earlier. You know, I used to work a lot with the uh, hotel and restaurant workers union people. And there's some tensions among people who do that, that kind of hard work. Roofers, one of our organizers was a roofer. Um, and so, yeah, there's all kinds of tensions in the workplace, and, and but but there are tensions in families. Okay, there's okay. tensions between Latinos who are uh, uh, who are undocumented and Latinos who are who are who are, who've got papers. Okay, so there's always going to be conflicts and tensions. We have a wonderful antidote for that. It's called politics. And I would just argue that that's the, the, what we really need to do is to figure out how to teach people how to do politics. Well, I'm extremely sympathetic. I'm jumping into uh, what is rightfully Glenn's space here, but no, it's all good. Um, I, I'm all in favor of politics, but it seems to me um, you've got to you've got to um, you, you, you've got to you got to deal with the fact that. Um, it's also politics um, that the, the, the ways in which uh, African Americans and, um, uh, and Latino leaders are coming together to make common claims or, or, or trying to do that in, in recent decades, uh, I think has contributed to the, to the kind of populist uh, outrage uh, that we that has produced uh, and put into the White House of Donald Trump, um, and, and you know, so I mean, what adds up politically for you adds up differently politically for others, and, and I'm not sure you're you're, you're acknowledging that. Um, and I don't think you're really. I mean, really, the question on the table is Glenn's, which I don't think you you really got to, which is, you know, spin this out a hundred years, and how is the politics that you managed to put together now? In a very positive way, I'm not, you know, I'm not taking pot shots at it. Of trying to bring together a multiracial coalition of blacks and Latinos. Well, suppose it works out just as Glenn said, it might work out, and, oh, and, and, and African Americans wind up leaving left, getting left out once again. Well, okay, I'm trying, I'm, trying, I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm Look, in Los Angeles, where I spent yeah. a lot of time. Sure. And I still do spend a lot of time in Los Angeles. Yeah. But we're trying to figure out uh, there's, it's, there's, there's at least five or six groups of people that mm -hmm. we have to think about, okay? And, and I'm just being really cavalier when I say that because there's more than that. I mean, I'm trying to uh, bring another, right now, the leader organizer of 1LA is Chinese American. Okay. Uh, his father grew up in mainland China. Uh, he speaks three languages, Chinese, Mandarin Chinese, Spanish, and English, okay? He went to Yale Law School, okay? And he went to Yale Law School to learn how to okay. organize, okay? Yeah. Be a better organizer, right? And he's, he's, he's a top-flight guy. Uh, I'm trying to bring another Chinese-speaking organizer to L.A., okay? If I had the money, you know, right now we also have a, a woman who is Hindu organizing in L.A. I need you know, at least three or four more others, okay, uh, who are African-American, at least two others who are African-American. And so I'm not, we're, we're trying to figure out how do you create 
<laughs> not just a coalition of African Americans and Latinos, but Jewish congregations, you know, Armenian congregations, Chinese congregations, Korean congregations. I mean, you know, it's 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 it's, it's daunting. Uh, so I, I don't think you can just form coalitions of African Americans and Latinos. You have to form coalitions which are much broader than that. And the way in which, but you always have to be mindful uh, of race, not as a a genetic or sociological factor, but as a political or or, or psychological factor. Okay. Can you say a little bit more about that? What What's the the racial angle for the Chinese? How does that relate to the racial angle for the Mexicans? And how does that relate to the racial angle for the Blacks? Oh, no, I'm just talking about the racial angle for the African Americans. Okay. We have, we can't not, I mean, not, I'm sorry, I mean, not to put words in your mouth. We always have to be mindful of the special historical circumstance and the sensitivities of African Americans. That is correct. Try to forge multiracial coalitions on behalf of progressive policy. That's correct. You can never, ever, 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 ever forget Lincoln's second inaugural. That we may, it may have to be so that for every, there may be a have to, we have to shed a drop of blood for every whip of the lash. For every drop of blood drawn by the lash, another shed by the sword. Sword, yes, exactly. And, uh, Ron White's, my friend Ron White's book on the second inaugural Lincoln's greatest speech is required reading for all of our organizers. Uh, Can you just finish that out? Uh, how is Lincoln's and second inaugural related to what we're talking about right now? Well, because Lincoln says basically that the sin of slavery is not a Southern problem. It's an American problem. It's, it's a burden that, it, of, of guilt that has to be you will pay for it. We're, 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 as Dr. King would say, we're overdrawn at the bank, okay? Insufficient funds. And there has to be, that is something which the, we will never, ever, ever, ever uh, re relieve of that burden. It's something which we're going to have to, at least for another 100 years, if, if not more. Uh, we can never forget that. Uh, uh, and uh, I remember... One of the greatest theologians I like, my friend Stanley Harrow, said, you can't just say what Bob Dole said, which is, what is a little slavery between friends, okay? It's, it's something which we can never, ever uh, forget, uh, just as we cannot forget the Holocaust. There are things which we are burdened with, we have, we're obligated to deal with, okay? Uh, and that's, well, slavery is one of those. If, if I can respond to that, um, um, I couldn't agree more, and um, I'd like to make I make it clear. I come from a, a, a background of uh, blue collar, uh, white ethnic, where I wasn't raised to think that way. Um, I would reject the notion that I was raised to be a racist, but I sure as heck wasn't raised to to, to acknowledge those kinds of fundamental claims that African Americans have on the rest of all Americans, okay? And I certainly believe that very, very firmly. But that very position causes me to be very skeptical and very critical when I see other groups, and, I, and, and this is where I specifically have Latinos in mind, uh, making claims that look an awful like the, like the claims that African Americans are make uh, are have made and are continuing to and and need to make on, on, on the American polity, that they that the Latinos describe their situation and make their claims in ways that echo, if if not if not exactly mimic, the claims that African Americans have made, and I think that's that's unfair to African Americans, and I also think. It's one reason why we have the kind of populist outrage we have in America today. Because I think at some point, at some level, large numbers of Americans, decent Americans as well as non-decent Americans, and there's plenty of the latter, I acknowledge that for sure, um, have come to the conclusion 
the, the claims that are being made uh, by immigrants, by Latinos, are ones we that are overwhelming us that we can't acknowledge that we can't meet be, because we 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 barely made them vis a vis African Americans, however begrudgingly. But Peter, um, come on, though. that is to say that hold on just a minute, Ernie. That is to say the claims made through the voice of people of color, yeah, which in an intersectional way. Yeah. Broadens broadens the obligations the country has to African Americans so as to extend to all of those who are not of European Anglo descent. Yeah. Undermine the possibility to succeed in the uh effort to get progressive social policy politically enacted and feed a backlash or a reaction that mm -hmm. comes from the uh, those who are going to be on the short end of the majority minority uh, dispensation that is just around the corner. And so we should be, if we want to succeed in progressive advocacy, slow to make those people of color claims. But let, but let, let's, 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 let's back up a bit, okay, because I'm starting to feel a little bit uneasy about this and uncomfortable because... Good. Most, yeah, I was going to say the same thing. <laughs> most, most Latinos... The only claim they want is they want to work. They want their kids to get an education. They want their kids access to health care. They're not making inordinate claims. They want their, the schools to be good. They want the teachers to be competent, okay? You know, my, my son, Jacob, you know, was in high school, and the, the teacher said the Japanese started the First World War by bombing Pearl Harbor, okay? <laughs> He came home <laughs> outraged, okay? And he worked hard to get her changed, okay? <laughs> but, I mean, he wasn't making, I don't think, an inordinate demand <laughs> that, that the teacher understand a little bit of history, okay, and not make those kind of mistakes. I mean, you know, uh, so I, I, I... Okay, but then but then, don't call the uh, uh, immigration uh, minimalist a racist when he or she advances argument that may be right or wrong about the border, because when you do that, when you call them a racist, when you make it a racial issue, you evoke Lincoln's second inaugural, but on behalf of a population to which it doesn't apply. Yeah. Well, yes, but remember, as long as you understand, Glenn and Peter, you know, the history of brutality against Mexicans in South Texas, okay, is horrendous. And it's just now being uncovered, okay, by historians, okay? Yeah. A lot of it had to do with labor and labor organizing. And just the, and, and a lot of it was, it was not just anti-Mexican, it was anti-worker, okay? Yeah. And, and, you know, I mean, Jay Gould once said, I can buy one half of the working class to kill and murder the other half of the working class. And he almost did that when the Knights of Labor had their great railroad strike, okay, uh, in Texas in 18, there was a woman named Ruth Allen, who was an economic historian at the University of Texas, wrote a great book, which nobody reads, on the, the great railway strike of the Knights of Labor, okay. And, uh, and it was just armed conflict, okay. And just, so not only do you have young Latino men being shot and killed, in the border, but you had young white workers being shot and killed, you know, with impunity, okay, by Pinkertons and, and, and uh, others who were brought in to break, you know, strikes. And, you know, Martin Rabbit Sr., the congressman from San Antonio, said that Henry Ford had more thugs working for him than, than any mobster in Chicago, okay, uh, and he was using them to break strikes. So, you know, there's a long, long history of brutality against working people, black, white, Chinese, Mexican, et cetera, okay? By, and, and, and a lot of it was done with impunity. I mean, Como uh, se llama, the, uh, the hero of the Battle of Gettysburg, uh, uh, can't remember his name, the general said, I fought for free labor at Gettysburg, but also you know, when he was breaking a strike, okay, uh, with, with the U.S. Army under mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, so I'm trying to say that we have a lot to answer for. 
But okay, those we have a lot to answer for as a country. Okay, uh, you know, Hugh Thomas just finished a book about the, the Spanish, you know, conquest of the New World, and he, because he's a good historian, cites chapter and verse of the brutality, the enslavement, uh, the destruction of Native American populations. At the same time, he comes to the conclusion that overall it was a good thing. Okay, well, that's it. That's his, <laughs> notwithstanding all the citations of brutality, at least he, he cops to all that. We don't, unfortunately, we, we don't even want to cop to that, what, what the brutality and the, and the oppression. We just want to gloss over that. I I'll give you the last word, Peter. I think we want, we're running out of time here. Okay. Well, we're well, next to the last word, if you will. All right. We don't, um, you know, I don't necessarily disagree with any of that history, um, but it's but it's all very clear that those kinds of class arguments uh, are not very workable in contemporary American politics. They very seldom have been, and what has traction and what, ha uh, however begrudgingly, has been the claims of African Americans, ipso facto, race claims on the larger polity, and it seems to me that's the that's the path that latino and to some extent even other immigrants but especially latino immigrants are pursuing because that's the one that's been laid down for them uh, i don't like uh, academic cliches but it's path dependent that path has been has been laid out for latinos they're following it it seems to me and and i think that's part of the reason we're getting the reaction we've gotten to the latinos their claims overwhelm large sectors of American society for the reasons that Glenn had, had well articulated. Let me just mention as a footnote on that, uh, John David Scrutiny's uh, very fine book, uh, The Minority Rights Revolution, mm. uh, paints this story in uh, graphic detail in the late 1950s and early 1960s as the regime uh, of uh, minority rights, you know, and civil rights protections and so forth evolved uh, in its infancy. And he makes, I think, a very compelling argument that the groups he's, you know, question is, which groups got included and which groups didn't? Who right. are minorities in America? Why are the Jews not a minority? Why are the East European immigrants not a minority? And so on. And he says, to the extent that you could make an analogy between your group situation and the situation of the Blacks, you're in. Okay? Yeah. The Native Americans are in. The Mexican Americans are in. The Jews are not in, the Hungarians, the Slavs are not in, but the in or not in turned on the capacity to formulate a narrative in which you could portray the plight of your population in terms that were similar to or analogous to that of African Americans. Now, I'm not in saying that begrudging people, but I would uh, follow Peter in noting that there are po larger political consequences to that, especially in terms of backlash or reaction from the uh, plurality of the population, which is not minority. Well, are, the difficulty I'm having with all this is that it, 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 my own experience is, you know, I have, when we organize in San Antonio uh, with the COPS organization, as you know, Peter, we never called ourselves, we never identified ourselves racially. We right. talked about communities organized, okay? Right. When a councilman was running for office and he said he wanted to represent the barrio, Andres Sanabia, the president of the COPS organization, got up and said, okay, Mr. So-and-so, we live in communities, okay? We don't live in the barrio, okay? And right. we, don't, we don't want you to represent the barrio. We want you to represent our neighborhoods and our communities and, and, our, and, and so we've always operated on that on that basis, okay? Carmen Badillo, the, the third president of the organization, always said to me, Mr. Cortez, I don't want to be a Chicano. I don't want to be that, uh, you know, I, because I see a lot of waste in that direction, okay? And she has spent a lot of time in Germany, uh, you know, with her husband in, in the armed services. So that, there was always that desire to mesh, if you will, the symbols of the flag uh, and and the republic for which it stands, okay, and the republic being the public thing, mm -hmm. and understanding that concept of the public thing, and understanding that that, that was they were, they were trying to create, and I I don't want to go 
in many ways in the way we're going, because my interest are, is creating the public thing mm -hmm. so that we can deal with some really serious challenges and difficulties, one of which is the historic, almost original sin of race, okay? Which is, a, which is, is something which we have to overcome in order for us to be able to deal with issues of, of class and ethnicity and fairness, okay, and inclusivity, and so, so that we can see beyond our prejudgments and see our interests, okay? Konosayama, uh, uh, the, the uh, Lee Atwater used to say, he, doesn't, he didn't want people to be organized around their interests. He wanted to mobilize people around their fears and their anxieties and their insecurities. He said, if you can mobilize people around their fears and their anxieties and their insecurities, then you can prevent them from seeing their interests. Okay, he apologized for that on his deathbed, but that was the success. His success story: how to get people polarized around their fears, their anxieties, and their insecurities. And we're, we're I don't want us to play to that, to that fear, that mobilization of fear, mobilization of anxiety, and and mobilization in the politics of resentment, or how you pronounce the French word, which is corrosive. How is it among? Which is corrosive. Okay. And it's, it goes beyond envy. It's corrosive. And it prevents us from ever seeing possibilities of relationality, of building trust. And without trust, you know, we can't. Charles Payne has made a point of trust is a, is a prerequisite for, for successful education. It's a prerequisite for any, any political institution. And we've got to get beyond that. And that's all, the only way to do that is to get people to see their interests. Okay. And that's where I want to go. Okay. Okay. But Once again, I, I want to give Peter the last word, but that was very good, Ernie. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you, um, Glenn. Um, Ernie, I, I don't think you meant it this way, but um, I, 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 you know, I, I'm not, I'm not about uh, Lee Atwater's business of. I know, really, resentment. You're and, not Lee Atwater. Don't worry, don't worry about that, Peter. I don't. No, think I, I, I have no illusions one way or the other. I don't have his political skills or his evil genius. Okay, um, <laughs> but but um, evil intent. <laughs> yeah, um, but you know, I would say to you that the shoe is on the other foot. That the 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 forces that are stirring up resentments these days are people on the on the liberal and left end of the of the spectrum because they refuse to take any kind of to take seriously any of the grievances of the people whom they've aroused and what i'm trying to suggest to you is that the kind of policies and perspectives that i think pretty clearly i don't think this is unfair uh, that that you're that you're you know sort of that you're advocating that you're inclined toward um has gotten to the point where it's creating resentment so that we cannot come together as a community, uh, as a national community, and, 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 and determine what our, what our true interests are. Peter, I gave a talk at Denver, one of our organizing efforts, and one of my organizers, Paul Turner, was shocked because I said the, 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 one of the most at-risk populations are white males ages 50 to 65 because the no. morbidity rates, the mortality rates among them, Okay, is higher virtually than almost any other. You've seen Angus Deaton's work, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. and they, I, I got booed for that. Well, I don't. Yeah, well, that I, I'm, I'm yeah. not surprised. So my point being to you is, I have been making that point a lot. Okay, the the morbidity, mortality rates, the suicide rates, the drug addiction rates, the depression rates, the alcoholism rates among white males. Okay. The, the, the whole study that that is now coming out by Deaton and, and his wife, I forget, and Case. Okay. And yeah. Case. Yeah, and yeah. Case. Okay, I'm, I'm going to kill it off here right now, but we can have another of these conversations after a bit, I think. Uh, we hardly exhausted the terrain, but I think we explored it. I'm very grateful to Peter Scarry, professor of politics at Boston College, and to Ernie Cortez, both my friends, Ernie of the Texas Industrial Areas Foundation. Thanks for coming on the Glenn Show, guys. I don't think we answered all the questions, but we certainly Thank put a, put some on the table. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks to all of you. Same here.